<laughs> Andrew Janjigian's kitchen. Uh, thank you for joining us for our living room live stream. I'm Andrea Shea, and I'm the senior arts reporter from WBUR. And today I'm joined by America's Test Kitchen's bread guy, Andrew Janjigian. And we're going to show you all. Hey, there he is. And we're going to show you all how to create your own tiny sourdough bread starter right there in your own kitchen. Um, and before we go ahead and get started, I wanna remind you all that you can ask us questions using Slido, and uh, you just need to use the hashtag yeast, and I'll be getting those questions and sharing them with Andrew along the way. So, uh, hi, Andrew, thanks for joining us. Hi, hey, Andrea, great to be here. Yeah, it's great. Uh, we were just laughing about the Stephen Colbert, Jake, Gyllenhaal interview from about a week and a half ago where Jake Gyllenhaal, uh, as Stephen Colbert is interviewing him, is keeps telling him to be quiet and Colbert doesn't really understand why. And uh, turns out Jake Gyllenhaal is letting his sourdough bread rest and we have to be quiet. And then it turns out Stephen Colbert has a sourdough starter too. So it just kind of captures just this funny sourdough moment right now, which is what uh, Andrew also did. So um, I had been following Andrew on Instagram for a few months and that's at word loaf, as you can see on the bottom of the screen and I'm admiring his beautiful sourdough bread projects. I had a starter given to me by my colleague, Jesse Costa, photographer at WBUR, sitting in my fridge, not really doing anything with it. And um, and then I noticed Andrew's Quarantiny Starter Project. Um, and I thought it would be a good story for WBUR, so I did that for radio and for the artery. And Andrew, can you take us back to why you started this tiny sourdough project? Yeah, so um, it started uh, the second day we were um, working from home at America's Test Kitchen. Um, everyone on the Cook's Illustrated team now gathers every morning uh, over Zoom to discuss what they're up to for the day. Um, and at the beginning of the meeting, one of my colleagues, Andrea Geary, uh, also a, a, another great baker, um, she was working on a project at the time for um, oatmeal rolls. Actually, I have some of hers here, I'll show everyone. Um, I had to photograph them the other day for a photo shoot um, for the magazine. So these are her oatmeal rolls. And <laughs> she developed this recipe since we were on quarantine. And when she was getting started, she was saying how hard it was to find yeast at the supermarket. And um, a light bulb went off uh, over my head. Um, I realized that um, now is probably then a great time for people to start a sourdough starter because you don't need to use commercial yeast. And um, and it and I had and and given that she was also having a hard time finding flour at the supermarket, I thought even better. What if there was a way you could create a sourdough starter using just small amounts of flour? And um, the uh, the idea of or the name Quarantiny Starter came to me almost immediately because I, I have kind of a problem. I can't stop making puns in my head, and. Um, so I just decided to try it. And um, I, I created one using just small amounts of flour, like normally a sourdough starter. Um, I don't know, should we get into the process right away or should I? Um, yeah, why don't you talk about, there? usually sourdough, you use a lot of, it's the, the ingredients and usually yeah, so, you use more. Okay, so let, let, let me explain first what a sourdough starter is and how you, typically make one. So sourdough starter is a live culture of yeast and bacteria that live kind of symbiotically and they consume flour. In the process, they make flavorful compounds and carbon dioxide, which leavens bread. And <laughs> so the way you, you, if you don't have one given to you like you did, or um, you know your friends might give you one, if you don't have one, you can start one from scratch just using flour and water. And the reason why is because there are on a kernel of yeast, a kernel of wheat um, in nature, there are yeasts and bacteria on it already. And so in a bag of flour, those yeast and bacteria are there as well. And so by stirring flour and water together and letting it sit long enough, um, those microorganisms will, 
wake up and start to consume the flour. And over time, you can get a starter. The, um, but the typical way you do it is you take a cup of flour, mix it with a cup of water or so, and then you let it sit. And then once it wakes up, you take a little bit of that mixture and you move it to a, another mixture of flour and water. And day after day, slowly the, the uh, yeast and bacteria that you want propagate. And over time, you get a starter. But in the course of a typical process, you might use a pound, two pounds, three pounds of flour. It takes anywhere from two weeks to a month. Um, so you might use a lot of flour in the, in the process. So I thought, well, what happens if you try just doing it with a, a very tiny amounts? And so uh, my process, uh, I started with 10 grams of flour and 10 grams of water. So that's uh, four teaspoons of flour and two and a half teaspoons of water. So a lot less than you would normally use. Pretty tiny. Uh, yeah, and it worked. Um, I, so I posted a, a picture to my Instagram feed. Um, some people saw it, the Cook's Illustrated feed shared it. And um, within about a week, there were, I don't know, um, 600 people trying it out, following along. I was posting you know, daily updates on how it was doing. And um, people were starting to show their own. And now I think there are a couple thousand people at least that are doing it using the method that I've been developing during this time. Right, and so, and the process though, it can be a little intimidating for people, even though it, it's it's very basic. And I know- It's very I, simple, but yeah. yeah, but it's not it's not intuitive, especially if you've not worked with um, yeast before or, or sourdough before or microorganisms. It's, it, it's, a, it's kind of a mindset that, um, that to the uninitiated isn't obvious. And so, there's a lot of explaining that needs to, to go along. You, there's not a lot of work involved. You're just waiting most of the time for things to happen. Right, right. And so um, we have a question from someone. It's about using a neglected sourdough starter. And Stephen, I think we'll get to that question right yes. after we talk about creating it, because then you yeah, end up absolutely. having to keep it alive. So thank you. Um, we will get to the what happens with neglected starters that just sit in people's refrigerators, which is what I think Stephen Colbert actually had. So, um, so Andrew, yeah, can you tell us how to, how do we do it? You can show us right there. Okay, so yeah, I've got everything we need here. So, um, what uh, what I you, what I like for this process because it's so small is these uh, little tiny half pint mason jars um, and a lid. Um, you need water, and um, I, ideally, you want to use water that is free of uh, antibacterial compounds like chlorine or anything else that your water system might put into them. So, um, sure. I'd say you should use um, filtered water, bottled water, or distilled water, ideally, especially in the beginning, because like there's very, very tiny quantities of the organisms on the flour, and so chlorine will kill them, and so you, you have to avoid that. Um, so at later on in the process, once your starter is established, it's not necessary to um, to use any special water because it's pretty vigorous. Uh, but in the beginning, it's really important to try to avoid that. Um, same with flour. You want to um, use organic flour if you can get it. Um, and you ideally want to use a mixture of whole grain flour and white flour. Um, or even a all whole grain flour, if that's all you can have. One of the things that I also um, tr tried to do in this case, given that people were having a hard time and still are having a hard time finding um, any kind of any flour. <laughs> yeah, like I said, well, try it with whatever you can find. If all you can find is bleached white flour, then go with that. Un unfortunately, the bleach seemed to be the one place where um, it really didn't work very well. Right, um, and, and so. Quick question, like whole grain flour yeah. has more nutrients. Is that why you're it's, adding it's a, it? It's, 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 it's twofold. One, yes, more nutrients. But also, if you think about it, a whole grain flour is the whole grain. And so you have more of the grain that the yeast and bacteria were living on in nature. So then you're more likely to get the organisms that you want. The a white flour has all, the bran outer coating of the the grain removed and so you're that's where maybe they they were living to begin with so you, you have better success with um whole grain flour in the mix from, from and, the beginning and it tastes more interesting and it's more hearty yeah right yeah, yeah. absolutely um, but but there's a difference between 
in the sourdough starter process, the fl the flavor of it is sort of is not really factoring into it because most of what you what you're making along the way, and all each time you're refreshing it, you're just throwing away what you don't use, the, you know, from the previous batch. So you're not going to be eating most of what you make during this process. Right. So and that's so another another reason to keep it small because the we want to avoid too much. Right. Weight. So all right. So like, let's pretend. Let's make one now. Okay. Yes. So, um, so first of all, so this is the scale that I normally use for baking bread. This is a scale that can weigh up to 11 pounds. Um, but in this case, this is, it's not sensitive enough to weigh the tiny amounts of ingredients we're using. So um, while it's not essential that you be ex super exact in, when doing a sourdough starter, um, I like to use a precise scale. And so there, I use this little guy, which is um, a ten dollars scale that you can get on Amazon or other places, um, and it's very accurate to even just a gram. So that's what I use. The, in the recipe, I give people. I also give teaspoon amounts because that's the kind of quantities we're dealing with. But I, I just like to weigh everything. Any baker will tell you that you, you should be using a scale to do bread because it's precision does get important later on in the process. So. Um, uh, hopefully you can s see this. Um, so I have my jar and I'm just going to tear it and then I'm going to put five grams of white flour and I'm going to use uh, rye flour. Um, I, I actually think if you have a choice, rye is the best option. Why? Um, it just seems to do best for people. Um, whole wheat is, is also very good, but every um, I think it has something to do with in nature there are more of those yeast and bacteria on rye grains than there are on wheat for some reason, um, something to do with the nutrition. Um, and then I'm gonna add 10 grams of water. Okay. And I, I, I discovered that a chopstick was the best tool for stirring all this together. So, uh, and that's that's literally it. I'm, I'm done with day one. Um, and so the, the sort of consistency of the mixture is like, um, I've been telling people it should look like um, thick muffin batter. I don't know. Can you hold you it a little it. closer maybe? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it looks, yeah, or like cookie dough, cookie batter, yeah. or bread batter. Yeah. Quick mm -hmm. bread. Mm -hmm. uh, hang on a second. So um, that's it. And then um, the next thing we need to do is just to cover it. Uh, we don't want it to dry out. Um, so what I do is I take um, the lid and I invert the top so that um, it doesn't make a tight seal. That That's just to let the culture breathe so that, because it, uh, it's eventually going to start off-gassing carbon dioxide and things. And so this way it um, it can expand if it needs to. And that's it. And then you need to put this in a warm spot, um, which around here, my kitchen's pretty cold these days still. We're hoping spring will arrive <laughs> for real soon. Um, so um, what I've been telling people is to look for a warm spot in your house, like maybe it's above the refrigerator or in your oven with the light off, as long as you remember to put a piece of tape over the, um, the knob or something so nobody turns it on. I did have a couple of people send me pictures of like melted, they use some people use plastic containers and I got a picture of like a, a pan, what looked like a pancake and it was, it was actually a, like a deli container that had been melted because somebody um, forgot, to, forgot it was in there or their partner didn't know it was in there and, and melted it. Um, so yeah, you want a warm spot somewhere in the sort of high 70s is ideal. That sourdough likes um, 78 degrees or so, but anywhere from 70 to 85 is kind of what you want to shoot for. Yeah, and, and so that goes it. on for days, right? Like what yeah, happens so this, day so, two? So, um, so day two or the next stage is when it wakes up and that can be 24 hours later. It might take two or three days. Um, and I actually have one I um, started yesterday here, and it, it doesn't look a, that different, but you may be able to see little bubbles in the, it can be hard to see through the jar too, but there, uh, you can take my word for it, there are little tiny bubbles uh, all throughout the, the dough. Um, and, 
it's this is still kind of young. I think in a day it'll be even more um, active. Um, it, it's fragrant, or it's starting to get fragrant. Um, and the interesting thing is, uh, and something that I that I have to explain to people is that it's not going to smell good in the beginning. In fact, it might smell quite bad. Um, <coughs> People, uh, it will smell like cheese or um, vomit comes up often, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, it, it's just because in the beginning, there, there are other microorganisms on the flower as well. It's not like there's just the two that we want. There's a whole slew of different ones. And initially, those are the ones that wake up um, or those are the ones that are, that are most active. And so one of the things you need to just like trust the process and um, and just live with the fact that in the beginning, it's going to do strange things that even if you're familiar with sourdough, it's not going to look the way you expect or smell the way you expect. Um, but over time, each time you, you refresh it, then um, the, the yeast and the bacteria we want are going to start to get more populous and then eventually it will be a sour. So, so what you would do on day two or day three, whenever it is that it seems like it's really awake, is you would take a second jar like this, and then you just do the same thing all over again, except with one, one change. So again, uh, white flour. Rye flour. Again, five grams, five grams, ten grams. Yes, yeah, so so it's um so in in uh, in yeah so it's ten grams of flour, ten grams of water, and now what we're going to do is take ten grams of the one Stop. that I made yesterday and add it here. So it's ten, ten, ten. Okay. Except for the first time around, you're just going to add ten, ten, ten. So it's really easy to remember. Um, it's actually more of a pain to remember what the teaspoon amounts are. Okay, and I'm going to say something about this in a minute. But, uh, we'll come back to it. And then stir it together. And put it back in your warm spot. And, and then um, for the first, first week to 10 days, you're going to just do that uh, every 24 hours. And hopefully, Every 24 hours, you're going to come back to it and find that it is it is showing activity in the form of bubbles and maybe it's expanding and it's fragrant. Uh, sometimes the kind of aroma goes away in the um, sort of middle period of that, and a lot of people get panicked. They think, "Oh, I must have killed it somehow." And I, um, the one thing I've said to people throughout this uh, more than anything is just keep going. Just don't worry about it. Keep going. Trust that it's going to work out in the end. Um, right, and so, ultimately it goes like daily feedings for fourteen-ish days, yeah, or somewhere to ten to fourteen days. And what will happen is over time, um, it'll it'll start to expand, um, it'll start to grow in volume. And when it when that happens in less than twelve hours, then that's a sign that you should jump to twice a day feeding. So it's usually ten, seven to ten days to get to that stage, and then you're going to do it every twelve hours. So kind of in the morning and in the evening, um, and and that's it. So here, this is this is my tiny starter, the one I started uh, forty some days ago, and. Um, yeah, I use I use rubber bands on my jar to mark where the uh, the kind of the beginning level was, and so you can see this one. It's a little collapsed, um, but you can see it's it's about doubled in volume here after having. I did this this morning, so um, it's it's pretty active now. And actually, I baked with it plenty. Um, so this is kind of a, a mature, what I call a mature starter, and ready for for use. Right. But but that's it. So it's it's once a day for 10 days or so, and twice a day for maybe another two to three weeks, depending. Until it's expanded twice, twice yes. or two thirds its size, then it's- Yeah, it should, a, a, good, a, really, a really vigorous active starter will double to triple in volume in eight to 12 hours at the, at the proper temperature. Right, and you can test it when it's ready for use, right? Yeah, we can. I, I can show that as well. Um, the one thing I wanted to say about um, 
about the the initial or the one that I so I just took some out of this jar and put it into this jar. This is or no other way around. This jar to this jar. Um, and what I what I always recommend people do is you don't throw the, away the the what the jar before the dis the discard. As not we not discard. We oh, can talk just about the jar. In a no. Ah. This is, so so what you want to do is save the previous culture, put it in the fridge, and that's your backup. That's in case somebody turns the oven on while you uh, have your starter in there, or if something else goes wrong. Maybe, um, you know, people have had their starters go south for one reason. Someone or another. throws it away it's, because it just exactly. looks, yeah, like it looks like garbage. Trash. <laughs> right. And so your backup is just in the fridge in case something goes wrong. And if, and if you need to, you just go to the backup and treat it like it's today's culture that needs to be refreshed or fed. Um, and it's just a simple thing. I mean, if you, if the way I, I used to, I studied um, mycology and um, worked in a, in a microbiology lab. And, you know, if you have a culture that's imp important, you're not going to culture it and then just throw away the previous one. You're going to save the previous one as a, as a, a bank of your culture. And <laughs> even now with my mature starter I use every day, I always keep a backup of it. Um, I even have a back or I had a backup at, at work. I don't know if it's survived the quarantine or not, but in any case, it's just in case something go goes wrong, you can always go back to the previous one. Right, and and a lot of your um, your people that have been following along, and not just people, uh, but people name their starters because they're almost yes. like like pets. You're you call it yeah. microbial husbandry. You are kind yes. of taking care of this living thing. Um, yeah, it is. It is like a pet, and it's not like a pet in um, in, in a couple of ways because. For one, in one case, you're, um, what's really different and something that people need to kind of get their head around is that you don't, so people use the term feeding their starter, and I use it sometimes too, it's, it's perfectly appropriate, but what you don't, you're not just giving it new food each time you feed it. What you're doing is you're taking a little bit of the culture and you're moving it to new food. So you're, you're giving it a new home more than giving it a new food. So it's not like just putting more food in the dog food bowl. It's more like transferring it to a new home where there's all kinds of new food for it to consume. And you're getting rid of a lot of what you started with um, because you're you're because uh, there's a lot of acids and other chemicals that are produced and you want to kind of give it a fresh. It's more like uh, changing the bedding in your hamster cage or something <laughs> than it is uh, adding food. Right, right. And so people came up with some pretty clever pet names for this yes, foreign tiny uh, starter project. Yes. Um, I, I have the list, uh, an early list here. I haven't actually gone back recently. I'm sure there's many more, but uh, some of my favorites are uh, Clint Yeastwood, Courtney Love, uh, the Yeasty Boys, Bret Astaire, um, <laughs> Baby Thor. Some, some of them are uh, inexplicable, but, but uh, wonderful. <laughs> Uh, Quentin Quarantino, Vincent Van Do, and uh, this is kind of dark, but uh, Patient Zero. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, th they go on and on, uh, and, and people have been very creative. So then once it's ready to go, I mean, you can do a couple of things to, to test it, right? Like a float test? Yeah, so what I'll do is um, I'm going to... so. This is not tiny. This is my regular starter. I didn't, I have had a starter for many years. And so this is the one that I usually bake from. Um, and so what I can do is show you how the float test works uh, with this one. Okay. Let me know if this is something you can see, okay. I might have to ask you to move it up to the camera. Yeah, after that's fine. I can do that. Mm -hmm. So um, this is just a jar of water. You can use a bowl or something, but you want it to be tall so that um, if you, when you drop it in, it will have something to, to float on. And then you just take a blob of starter and you just drop it into the water. And hopefully this will actually work. Yes, it did. Okay. So it so, floats because there's a lot of um, yeah. air and... CO2. Yeah, so right, it's got gases in it, which is what you want to have a, a good loaf of bread. And um, 
you, it also has structure in, you know, because there's good gluten in the flour and because the acids help to strengthen the dough. So it, it's showing that it can hold carbon dioxide and that's a key factor in making a good loaf of bread. So this is sort of like the end point. If you can make this happen, um, the sort of doubling and tripling within eight to 12 hours is gonna have to happen anyway to get here. And this is a sign that it's ready to use for baking bread. So um, a woman named Susan Weiler, who I think it's the Susan Weiler I know, I hope. Hi, or <laughs> even if you're not, nice to meet you. Um, she asks, would bread flour work for a starter? Yes, yeah, so um, so what I, I tell people, they should use whatever flour they can get their hands on. Um, ideally, however, you, you, if you can get the kind of flour that you're gonna eventually be baking with anyway, you might as well use it because the gluten is helpful for this part of it. The, the ability to hold gases is dependent on having a sufficient amount of gluten. So um, low protein flours like, um, you know, uh, all purpose flour, don't have as much gluten as bread flours do. So ideally you'd work with like a whole grain flour and a bread flour. Right, and so you, so once you have one made, um, then, you know, maybe you might not want to be feeding it at, or shifting it to its new little house every day. Uh, no. And some people, no, you put it in the refrigerator and it can be kept kind of dormant or... Yeah, so this, I just took this out of the fridge. I fed it yesterday. Um, I'm going through a lot of it at the moment because I'm just baking a lot. Uh, I'm also doing tests for all, all this stuff. Um, but even so, I just keep mine in the fridge. And so the way the way you do it then is you, um, you refresh it, you let it sit out at room temperature for about five hours. So it's not fully through its cycle of 12 hours and it'll come up to about double, as you can see from the uh, where the rubber band is, this doubled, and then it goes in the fridge. And this will keep for, it, it'll keep for a month or two, um, or even longer to, and still be something you could take out of the fridge and revive. But um, ideally, it, you, you use it to bake with within a week or two. So if, right. you, if you, you know, I, I put mine in the fridge, for a week and I will pull it directly from the fridge and put it into a dough. Um, so it becomes really easy once you get to the healthy, mature starter stage. Right, yeah, because we had two questions. We had Georgia who asked, how often should I feed it once it's dormant? And you just... Yeah, yeah, so what, you know, I, I, I like to do it once a week if I'm not using it more often. Okay, and then um, uh, Stephen, Bergenstein, I think, uh, if I wrote this down correctly, um, he says he has a neglected starter and can you revive? Oh, right. Like for me, I'm always Absolutely. like, they seem immortal in a way. But they, I, they are. <laughs> they are. Um, last night I watched a, a great uh, video chat between my friend uh, Martin Phillip at King Arthur and uh, Ben Wolf at Tufts, um, and who's a sourdough um, biology expert. And um, he was saying that, that he thinks that sourdough stars are pretty bulletproof once they're established. Um, and, and I tend to, to agree just from experience that the case, um, if it's been in the fridge for, for months, I would, would just take it out and do exactly what I did today is, you know, add it to some fresh flour and water and, um, and let it go. It might, you know, depending on how long it's been there, it might take, it might take a while it probably won't, it won't take as long as it would to start from scratch, however. So it might take you a week or two to get it back to full health, but it, it won't take too long. Right, and sometimes if they sit in the fridge, because um, this one that I have, I was given in November from my colleague, and I let it sit in the fridge for a while, and like, it's not always pretty. <laughs> There's no, like it, liquid, it, it looks yes. gray, and like it looks yes, dead and scary. Called, <laughs> that's, uh, that's affectionately called hooch. Uh, because of the, the the smell and some people say to pour that off and and it's so probably fine it. to do that I just stir it in I don't think it matters one way or another um, I do think it's a good idea to stir your starter before you refresh it because it it kind of makes sh uh, sure that you're taking a little bit of everything with you when you go to the next um, phase right and so then there's all different recipes um, for making sourdough bread or uh, using your discard. Um. Yeah, so let's, um, so first we, get, we can talk about uh, bread first. So 
Um, I, this is a ba- loaf I baked yesterday. It's a um, oatmeal uh, porridge sourdough bread. Um, I haven't cut into it yet. I can see what it looks like on the inside. Um, hopefully, it looks good. yeah, I think it's acceptable. Um, oh yeah, that looks good. And I'm a big fan of porridge breads. It's where you make like a grain porridge, such as oatmeal or anything mm. else, and then you incorporate them to the, to the dough. And um, the nice thing about that, that is the water in the porridge um, keeps the dough really moist for a long time. So you, you, the breads keep even better when they have porridge in them. No. Um, smells just, really good. Just to go back for a second, Rachel Rice yeah. has a question. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. You, how long does it take using a tiny starter to get to the amount where you can make okay. a Okay, so that's, a, that's another thing that people were confused by. Uh, a lot of people early on were like, well, if I'm making a tiny starter, does that mean I can only make make tiny a tiny loaf, loaf of bread? <laughs> yeah, and you yes, you can. And actually, at one point, I baked a little tiny loaf in a little <laughs> pot. Um, but the thing is, if you if you remember, I said that when you refresh it, you take only a small amount of your current culture and move it to a, a new container of flour and water. So if you were and you keep the ratios the same, so you have ten grams of each. If you have 30 grams and you just use all of it to, to um, create a new one, then you would add 30 grams of water and 30 grams of flour. And now you have a 90 gram culture. And then if you take that and you do the same thing, you'll have a um, 270 grams. So like it's easy to expand its amount with each feeding. And eventually you can get yourself from this to this. Right, and then there's all different recipes on how to, how much to use in your recipe yeah. that you've developed yeah. for this even uses less starter, right? Then like yeah. typically? Yes, yeah, so that's a, a, a kind of a technique that um, Martin turned me on to. And it, um, it, it, it's sort of a, um, if people are familiar with the no need bread recipe from the New York Times, the, <laughs> a lot of people still, you, in that recipe you use a quarter teaspoon of yeast for a, a whole loaf of bread, which is a very small amount. And the way that works is that it sits out at room temperature for, you know, 18 hours before you shape it into a loaf. And so that yeast ex- grows and expands to be more than enough to leaven the bread itself. And this is the same thing, except with sourdough. So you use um, 60 grams in, in my case. Um, and that's maybe, you know, a quarter of what you would normally use in a, a typical sourdough recipe. And yet after eight, 16 hours at room temperature, it's fully risen and ready to be shaped into a bread. Right. That's great. And then I think you were going to talk about like what to do with discarded. Um, yeah. So, okay. So, um, yeah, let's talk about what discard is first. So, um, it's, so, so when, after, after, usually I say it's at the point at which you start to feed your starter twice a day is when it's going to start smelling like bread again like in the beginning it smells pretty bad in the middle it doesn't smell like anything at all but at some point it starts to get actual yeast activity and it will start to smell bready and that's the point at which it's like it also will taste bready and that's so that's the place where I tell people if you're going to save your discard you should start then so I don't recommend doing it in the early days when it's funky right Um, just so when it's when it's to, ready because it's going to add like delicious yeah, qualities exactly. to things. You want it to t- you want it to taste good. If you're saving something to to make food out of it, you want it to taste good to begin with. So, in that case, um, what you do is instead of so you have your culture of the day, you have your backup in the fridge. You feed your culture of the day. Your current culture goes into the fridge as the backup, and then your old backup, the one that you were saving up until that point, is something you would throw away because actually i just rotate between the two jars i don't have an infinite number of jars one for each day and so i clean out the the previous backup and put the new culture in it and so that that what you clean out of that jar is called it's discard it's something you're throwing away and so instead of throwing it away what you can do is put it in another container and throw it in the fridge and um that's what this is and it's kind of um you know it's still it's very sour smelling um it tastes sour which is not a bad not bad um and it's kind of loose it's not it's no longer 
um, got the structure that it would have. Yeah, more yeah. liquidy. Yeah, but it's still it's still got plenty of flavor. And yeah. So you can use it in so it's it's just flour and water and then the the flavorful compounds that were produced by the bacteria and yeast. And so what you essentially do is you use this in place of some of the flour and some of the water in a recipe. Right. And there um, are many, many recipes you can find. There are. And yeah. Like, and you, these are yeah, sourdough can, crackers that I made. And they're really yeah, good these, um, with discard. And they're really good. They're really sour, actually. But I like the, them. The, the crackers are sour? Yeah. So, that's, so these are some um, drop biscuits that I made yesterday with discard. And so half of the flour and uh in the recipe was discard i find that for some things it's good to put fre fresh flour and some things you can use just the flour that's in there um and these would normally be made with buttermilk which is a sour ingredient that gives a little tang it also reacts with the baking soda in the recipe to create lift and so instead of using buttermilk i just use sourdough discard because it has the same acidity it's got sort of the same consistency as buttermilk. And um, I used milk for the rest of the liquid. So it still has some of the milk proteins, which give flavor and texture. Right. And so, pan pancakes, uh, a lot of people make pancakes, yeah. right? Yeah. So sourdough pancakes are, are a thing. Whether you're using discard or just making it from your starter itself, it's a thing. And buttermilk pancakes are a thing. And so it's sort of, there's the obvious like link between the two, like, oh, Acid plus baking soda gives you um, lift, and sourdough pancakes are the sort of like starter discard recipe. But like the sky's kind of the limit. People do uh, cakes, quick breads like banana bread, um, crackers are an obvious one. I've made pasta dough. Um, mm. it's sort of, and there are recipes even for things like pizza and whatnot. I, I'm a little bit less sort of experienced with using discard to make things that need the lift that you get from the yeast. I don't always feel like you can count on your discard to leaven bread because it may have been in the fridge for a while. So this, I keep this in the fridge for two, two three weeks and it's still good for use. So I, I think you answered one of our um, viewers uh, questions, which was when can you start using discard for discard recipes? And really it was, when it smells yeasty, yeah. right? Is that yeah. the answer? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. When it smells like something you you would want to put in a bread or a, a, a food. Um, it, the only problem with doing tiny starter quantities is that you have very little to begin with. Uh, the recipe, the biscuits I made yesterday, used a cup of it, so you need quite a bit to get to that point. So, discard is something that um, it almost makes more sense once you have a starter that you're keeping at a larger scale because then you'll end up with more discard. You can always make discard by simply making more starter and then putting it in the fridge and letting it sit in there for a, a few days. Right. So now you've, when you've talked about this, this whole kind of um, process, you kind of refer to it like a practice almost. Like it really yeah. is this, like you've been doing it for years and you're still learning and experimenting. Like can oh, you re reflect I on that? Well, yeah, I mean, for start, for, for, to begin with, I, I, I mean, I've made starters in the past a few times, um, but once you have an established one, you don't really need to go back to the beginning very often, if ever. And um, so I, this, this time around, I really spent a lot of time with it and I was troubleshooting other people's. And so I learned a lot more about this process than I knew before. I began. It wasn't like I just was the expert on sourdough and taught everyone how to do it. I actually, we actually learned together during the, the whole process. Um, and so certain things, like I realized that like the ratios are important. And so this equal parts ratio is different than where I began. And I found that it was more reliable for people, um, myself included, if we kept it at equal parts. Um, I, you know, I, I now am more convinced than ever that like you really want a whole grain flour in the mix if you can get it. That said, people did have success just using white flour. So it's not the end of the world, especially now when it's still hard to find good flour. Um, but in terms of just the sort of sourdough lifestyle, <laughs> it, it does, it does, um, 
I think I got a lot of feedback from people saying how that this gave them something to kind of focus on. It was sort of meditative. And it is that, like, it, it, it forces you to slow down to its pace. It takes a couple of days before you see anything at all. And even when you're feeding it uh, with a healthy starter, you know, it takes eight to 12 hours to be ready. And the bread um, proofs more slowly than yeasted breads. It just has its own slower pace. And I think that there's something kind of comforting about that for, for people. Definitely for me, um, it gives you something to focus on that's not quite so dire. Right, right. And it's just, what an, in, I mean, it's just an interesting time for sourdough. It's like the sourdough yeah. renaissance was kind of, it's been brewing. I mean, I don't know if it's ever gone away, you know, but like, no. you know, I mean, I've been following you on Instagram for quite some time before all before your quarantine starter, right. admiring just the, the the sourdough culture, as in culture, not the culture, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, everywhere across the world, and uh, it's just it's just great that so many people are embracing it. It's such a um, yeah, hard, and in the middle of all is, of this. Yeah, and I, and it does it is something that was building slowly before this all started, but it was like it was one of those opportunity moments where it was ready and and uh, people were ready to em embrace it. Um, and so I, you know, the question is how many people will have success creating their starter, and how many people will stick to it after all this. I hope they do. I actually think that sourdough. Um, bread is unique and worth doing just be not because you can't find yeast. That's a good reason to do it too, but, but because sourdough actually for certain types of bread, I think it's superior. The breads um, have more complex flavor and they keep a lot longer. I, I think if you're somebody who bakes, you know, say you only have a, a few people in the household and you can't get through a, a loaf in a, in a day or two, a sourdough will keep for a week easily you know, maybe on day six or seven, it's it's it needs to be toasted, but it's still really good toast at that point. And yeast breads just are more ephemeral, and so um, I, I just think that sourdough is superior in a lot of ways. And and I think most people aren't aware of that, and so hopefully they are coming <clears throat> coming around to that now. So we we have a question. That's that's awesome. Yes. I could keep talking about sourdough for hours. Yes, as <laughs> Kelsey Roth, who uh, works at Exhibit A. Hi, Kelsey. Kelsey. Um, so brewing and yeast, obviously. Mm -hmm. Bread and beer go well together. But his question Absolutely. is, if using a recipe that calls for active dry yeast, how much starter should I use instead? Like, can you swap? So that, like, you yeah, know, so what's the trend? That's the, kind um, of, a, yeah. it's kind <laughs> of a difficult transition to make. Um, it's not like for every gram or teaspoon of yeast to use this much starter um but i would say for a i would say for a typical loaf of bread you might use somewhere between um 100 grams or to 200 grams of uh, starter to leaven it and so you need to experiment when it comes to kind of translating yeasted recipes to sourdough ones it's better to maybe look at um other sourdough recipes and see how much starter is in there based upon the amount of flour there is and, and use that as a starting point. It's like cross-reference. Yeah, it's never as easy as it, you would think. It's not like, oh, well, I, have, I only have instant yeast and I, I want to, in the recipe calls for active dry, how do I make that conversion? That's a very easy thing to do. This is a little more nebulous, but it's, it's definitely doable. Usually it takes me a few, um, a few rounds of tests to figure out how to convert yeast to sourdough. Right. Well, um, uh, we have about 15 minutes left, I think. So if people mm -hmm. have questions, start firing away. Um, <laughs> now is your time. Uh, one of the interesting things that uh, has also come out of this quarantine period and sourdough is 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 Godric. Can you can you talk about Godric in oh, San right. Francisco? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So that that was the, around the very same time, um, and I've actually talked to newspaper reporters about both things at the in the same story. Um, so somewhere, because so San, San Francisco quarantined relatively early compared to most other cities, and um, somewhere early on in their quarantine, um, there was an unknown person putting sourdough starter in a bag or in bags and then um, 
stapling them to telephone poles and saying, help yourself, a sourdough starter. And um, as far as I know, uh, this kind of Banksy-like character has never been revealed, but maybe. <laughs> um, but, so, but he named yeah. it Godric. Godric was yeah, the name Godric. of his starter. <laughs> exactly. It's and, so great. Um, it is. Um, people were a little bit skeeved up by the whole idea of a bag of sourdough on a pole. Um, but I'm <laughs> sure people are now using that to bake bread too. So it's great. Yeah. I hope so. And you you also posted, and actually, um, Jake Gillenthal received his sourdough in the mail, his sourdough oh, starter. Did he? So yeah. he didn't start one himself, but yeah, you. Let me go. I'll go get the. Yeah, because this speaks to the um, indestructible or revivable quality of yeast. Where, yeah, so this uh, is maybe a little <laughs> more sanitary than um, a, a Ziploc bag filled with wet starter. This is um, dried out starter um that i made so what you can do to share yours once you once it's established you have to have a mature starter otherwise you're just giving your friends some more work um you want it to be a healthy starter um and you literally just take your starter and thin it out until it's kind of you know kind of crepe batter loose consistency pour it onto um a sheet pan that's covered in parchment paper and um just like a thin layer and then let it dry out over the course of, usually takes three or four days, depending on how hot it is and how humid. And eventually um, it's, it'll just turn into like a, almost cracker like, and you can just um, bust it up into a, like a kind of flakes. And this you can just send in, in the mail. And, right. um, and then literally when the person you give it to can take flour and water, mix them together and add a teaspoon of this or so to it. and um, I sent some to a friend who started a starter um, and it failed. And so I said, whatever, just send you some. And I mailed her some. And within five days, she had baked a loaf of bread with it. So it's very fast to recover. Once wow. Yeah, that's and, amazing. And this is actually, it's a great way to back up your own starter, too. You can store this in the fridge for a long time. So if something goes wrong, you always have another backup to go to. Um, yeah, it's all right. I think we're gonna we're gonna have a lot of questions coming. Um, okay. So Sarah Putnam asks, I've read about and tried leaving my starter out on counter covered by a dish towel, but is it mm -hmm. better to refrigerate? Well, it depends on what you're doing. If you're um, if you're trying to feed it and get it ready for baking, um, then you you want to leave it out at room temperature. Um, unless you're doing, unless you know that you're doing it at five hours at room temperature and then in the fridge uh -huh. for later use. Um, right. So leaving that. it, yeah, I so leaving of, it yeah. out um, is fine. Um, I, I prefer something a little bit more um, sort of sealed than a dish towel. Because I, I think even a towel is a little too porous and so that you'll get a skin on top of it. So I just use either... Um, like a plate or something or a lid or a piece of plastic wrap loosely placed over it uh, is fine. Okay, great. Here's one from James Billon. Uh, I noticed my sourdough bread has large air holes. Is this normal? It is so normal. That's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> is this normal? And is there anything I can do to correct it to make it easier for sandwiches? Okay, so um, one, well, so yes, um, a good, so let's look at this. So this is pretty good. You could make sandwiches out of this one. It's got a couple of holes. So it depends on whether he means that there are big holes throughout or if there are a few small holes. Pocket holes. Few holes. Like, so this is a shaping issue. I should have pushed out some more of the gases before I shaped it. But if you have, but like sort of, uh, I don't have any here, but like one of the hallmarks of like kind of a great, sourdough loaf or at least the instagram hallmarks when people show their crumb they're all about like how big are those holes um and, and so the way to get around that is to uh, make it tighter in one way or another and so like adding whole grains will it will sort of prevent the gluten from being quite as strong and so you'll end up with a much finer crumb like this one yeah so that's something I, yeah. and and you get more flavor that way so i i think that like you get the kind of the uh, double 
Yeah. Whatever. And I've been using all whole grain flour because I can't find any in the grocery store. Yeah. So I've been uh -huh. um, tracing it down. But like this is a picture, see if I can share it, of like a, a whole grain sourdough. So the holes are much tighter. Yeah. Um, if it's 100% whole grain, it's going to be very dense. And that's not a bad thing. That's, that can be really nice. I mean, if you think about a rye bread, it's, 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 there's no holes really to speak of. Right. So here's a story, a uh, story, <laughs> a question from Susan Kellerman. Can I start with 100% rye flour and then switch to rye white bread flour mix? At what point? Yes. And at what point should I switch to the? So the one thing we, the one thing we didn't talk about is um, that this, my mature starter that I feed once in a while is 100% white flour. And so eventually when you get something that's mature, you, I prefer to keep it just on white flour. Um, that's because A, it's the flour that I'm using to bake with most often, and B, it's not as nutritious as rye or whole wheat. And so the starter will kind of expand and um, it'll move at the rate that I want it to. If there was rye or whole wheat in the mix, it would move faster. It might get sour sitting in the fridge because it's still active. So white flour is actually the best flour, in my opinion, to keep, you know, to maintain your starter on. So what you do is, a, yes, you can start with rye alone. If that's all you have, that's great. Eventually, what you want to do is introduce white flour in a 50-50 mix. And then eventually, what you want to do is wean off of the whole grain flour. So, um, you know, just start, do, instead of doing 50-50, do 75-25 and 80-20 and 90-10. Eventually, you'll get down to all white flour. Keeping in mind that, like, your flour, your, your um, yeast and bacteria might complain a bit and you know they, they where all that great food go and so it might lose some activity and it might take a, actually take a while for it to fully adjust to the white flour so a lot of people had great success getting to the, the a certain point and then they switched to white flour my recommendation and then found it kind of died back but eventually it will come back um, and it'll be fine this is perfectly happy just being on white flour Great. Oh, here comes one. Um, and forgive me if I mispronounce your name. Uh, looks like Juzer Zarif. Um, are there any downsides to using whole wheat flour in the starter when storing it in the fridge? Well, so that was just, I just explained that. So yeah, I, I think that unless you're keeping a whole wheat starter because you like are baking all whole wheat breads and um, then maybe that would be a reason to do that. I, I think that um, it can get kind of sour. Like when you put it in the fridge, it doesn't go completely dormant. It's still active, it's just slowed down. And so if it's faster to move on a whole grain flour, that means it's faster in the fridge still. It's not, it's still slowed down, but it's gonna be faster, which means that it's gonna get more sour. It's gonna, um, it's gonna get to the point where it needs to be refreshed in the fridge more quickly because it's got the whole grain in there. So white flour is ideal for like kind of keeping it slow enough to do this fridge storage method. Right, great. And here comes one from uh, H. Blyden. My discard is very bubbly in the fridge. It keeps popping the plastic top off the yeah. container. Is it because it's a plastic top maybe? Because there's no relief? Um, yeah, is it so doing okay? It means it's alive. It's, it, it's actually doing fine. I actually had a colleague this morning uh, chat me on Slack about how her her discard was more active than her starter and she switched to using it um, and then she just baked the best loaf of bread she's made yet. So um, nice. yeah, sometimes, some, so there's a whole, I had this a couple of posts I've done on Instagram where I sort of help people troubleshoot problems along the way. And one of the things I suggested if people were having a hard time getting their started to do anything and they were ready to give up, is to just take a break and put it in the fridge. And because I, I've heard from other people that their their discard started showing activity after a few days in the fridge. And so I thought, well, that's a great way to take a break from all the daily feedings and maybe give your starter a chance to catch up. So I would say, yes, do, maybe put it in a container that can breathe a little. So like, I just keep the lid a little bit loose so that it's not like jammed down tight or invert the lid on a, a metal banded one. And um, yeah, think, consider your discard a possible place that you can find a healthier culture and work from. Right, great. Um, Rachel Rice has a 
Question, can you review again how to feed mature starter that's been in the fridge? Can you feed it cold? And do you need to mm. leave it out to feed before putting back in the fridge? Yes, okay. So um, this is probably not the best place to give recipes. And I think that like ideally you have um, some place to go. So you, if you go to, <laughs> if whoever is needs uh, assistance, if you go to my, Instagram feed, you'll find a link to the Cook's Illustrated page that has all this stuff. And one of the things, the process I described there um, tells is how to do, how to how to scale it up. And, and very soon I'm gonna have a post about how to keep your starter uh, alive in the fridge this way. Um, but one of the things that I need to point out is that that one to one to one ratio that I have been talking about is again, another thing that's best done during the creation process. And actually once you, start to maintain a healthy starter, you would use less starter to flour and water. And so that in that case, it's a two to two to one ratio. So two parts flour, two parts water, and then one part starter. That will slow it down again. And um, and so that's so that's it. You And you can use, take it right out of the fridge. You don't have to warm it up or anything like that. Um, you mix it with flour and water and let it sit for five hours at room temperature. Ideally, at that point, it will have doubled in volume. That's a sign that it's nice and active. Then it just goes in the fridge and until you need it next. Right, and you use the rubber band to mark your glass jar. Yeah, I use masking sort of little, tape sometimes, but a rubber band I yeah. think is even better. Yeah, it's the low water mark, and, uh, so you can see what the, where the high water mark is. Right. So, um, it, oh, go ahead. I was going to say um, it's a good idea to keep an eye on your starter during the cycle from whether it's 12 hours, 24 hours or you know, or less, um, because some if you let it sit and you're not there, um, it could rise to a certain point and then collapse. And then you wouldn't actually. And I think a lot of people are missing the sort of high watermark moment and thinking that there's nothing going on. And so. Um, you know, do it, putting in a clean jar, at least you can kind of see some residue along the sides of the jar where yeah. it, it rose and fell. So it's a good idea to like check it after six hours and see where it's at instead of just waiting, waiting till the serve, you know, the end point, whatever it is, 12 or 24 hours. Right. And it's very satisfying when you see that it's uh, expanding. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, Every day I, I look at it, and I'm happy that I see activity. <laughs> so Terry Rice. Yeah, no. Um, Terry Rice, would it be good or bad, a good or bad idea to use my easy fermenter lids? Oh, those are for like fermenting pickles or something in a jar. Um, I, it can't hurt. I think it's probably uh, overkill. It, it'd be kind of cool. Yeah, those have like kind of airlocks or something on them so that they let out gas but don't let oxygen back in. I don't think it's necessary, but it's kind of badass. Right, which is a, 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 a kind of, you wanted to mention a few tools that make life easier. Yeah, well, so most, so the sourdough process is really just jars, jars and <laughs> stirring things and, and a good scale. Um, but uh, for, I mean, for bread, I'm, I'm a big fan of um, these. This is kind of a new thing here. These are um, the wood pulp uh, oh. roofing baskets. Um, I converted over to these entirely fairly recently. Um, they're really good at um, at pulling moisture away from the the dough so that it doesn't stick. Because something that uh, a problem people have, especially beginners, but even me, is you put a loaf of bread in a proofing basket and you go to turn it out and it's just bonded to the to to the the cloth hope, or whatever I, it is. I hope that doesn't happen to mine, which has towel. <laughs> but I'm gonna bake it um, after this. So yeah, well, you have to share pictures for people. Um, so these wood pulp's really good. It it like will take the water from the the outside of the dough and pull it away, and so that even very wet doughs will come out of these really easily. Um, you know, a Dutch oven is an essential tool for baking bread. I think that like the, a loaf of bread baked in a Dutch oven is as good as one baked in a, um, a fancy deck oven or wood-fired oven. Um, you get the same amount of steam around the loaf uh, as you would in, a, in an oven that has steam injectors. And so, like, I tell people, if, if you have a Dutch oven or you get one, you'll be able to make the best loaf of bread possible. There's nothing better than that, as long as you have a good recipe. Um, I, I recently got one of these, which is um, a fancy bread baking Dutch oven. It's, um, 
it's a cast iron one. And the, and the nice thing about this is that it's not round. I like long loaves. Um, I prefer being able to slice pieces across the bread instead of having to cut it. You know, if you, if you do that with a round loaf, you have, you get tapering widths of, of bread. And so I find that kind of annoying. And, um, I, I, so this is a great kind of pan to use for that. They're also, kind of expensive. And a, but a bread scraper, right? Very oh, helpful. Yeah. So I have, a, I have millions of dough, dough scrapers. I like these big plastic ones like these, uh, metal ones are good for really scraping the counter clean and then like round ones for scraping things out of the bowl. Um, oh, I recently got turned on to these. I haven't even opened this package. So um, these are shower caps. <laughs> you buy them oh, that's CVS. nice. These ones maybe are a little big, but this is great for, these are, okay, these are way, way bigger than I thought. I have smaller ones. <laughs> but you can literally just put them over the, a bowl and it'll keep uh, things from drying out. And they're nice and uh, reusable. Yeah. So don't buy one size super jumbo ones. Those are too big. <laughs> um, here are some smaller ones. Um, so get get the smallest one. You know, they eventually they kind of get gross and you throw them out, but they're 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 better than plastic wrap because you can reuse them a lot. Right. And they do a right. great job. Um, and alarm is always good to have. So, you can score a loaf of bread with a knife uh, or just a razor blade, but a curved lawn like this is best for getting those good. So that's uh, a razor ears. when you, you're cutting into the top yeah. of your dough right before yeah. you put it in the oven. Exactly. Yeah. That's Which is hard. <laughs> it is hard. It does take some practice and it's, it's not intuitive. It's good to, um, it's good to watch other people do it. I, I think YouTube is a great place to, uh, and now Instagram, there's a lot of videos too. Watching people, do shaping and scoring and all that ah, stuff uh, is a great way to figure out how to do it yourself because it's not intuitive necessarily right right so um, um one um yeah any other tools or do you think those are pretty um yeah i think those are all my tools um the one thing i didn't show is over there i have a cabinet that um, i just took everything off one of the shelves and uh, there's an outlet in the back of it and i put um a seedling heating mat in it with a little uh, temperature controller, which you, you could buy online or um, you can even get them in um, pet stores because they're used in like iguana cages and things. And that's my proofing cabinet. So th that w that's my way of getting 75 to 80 degrees year round, or at least right. when it's cold. Um, can, can so you, I recommended that to people. Can you just define for people the, the, the phrase proofing? Yeah, so pr proofing, literally means like proving that the bread is alive and it's the process from the beginning to the end uh, before you bake it of the yeast and bacteria consuming the the sugars in the flours and converting them into carbon dioxide and flavor and getting rise um, and typically there's what what's called a first proof or a second proof or a bulk proof and a shape proof and you know first the dough starts out just in a bowl and um, it proves to a certain point and then it's the, the sign to shape it and then you proof it again because you're knocking out some of the gases and you want it to recover before it goes in the fridge and or goes into the um, oven to bake. Right, and so proofing can happen in a proofing cabinet or it can happen in the fridge overnight yeah. for eight to eight, 18 yeah. hours or yeah, typically for, for I do a lot of uh, refrigerator proofing and it'll proof at room temperature for uh, the beginning phases of it to really get going. And then once it goes in the fridge, it'll slow it down. And so it's something it's really convenient to be able to shape a loaf of bread, put it in the fridge, say in the evening, and then be able to bake it anytime in the following 24 hours. Usually I like to bake in the next morning or I'll shape it in the morning and then bake when I get home at the end of the day. And so you take it out of the fridge and do you put it right into the oven after you score it or yeah, do you straight, let it? Straight, in, straight into the oven. That's the beauty of it is it can go, you just get your, your Dutch oven hot and take it out of the fridge and score it and put it in. Um, you have to have the right recipe for that. Like a lot, the recipe needs to have the proper amount of time built into the beginning stages of it so that it goes into the fridge with the right amount of activity and that way it, it can sit. I've like, I've, it took me a while to get a hang of like how long it needed, what it needed to look like before it goes into the fridge. 
but a lot but nowadays there's a plenty of recipes around that are built that way and so you know it's helpful to know what to look for but hopefully the recipe will guide you the whole way right well, great. Um, I don't know if anybody has, oh, here's another question. Julianne Kahn, or Julian, um, what is your favorite flour to use for your starter and for the actual sourdough bread? So I'm, I don't feel particularly, um, I don't really feel like it's super important to feed your starter on a particular flour. I do feel strongly about what I use in my bread. Um, for one thing, I, I, I'm not, I don't work for King Arthur, I'm not sponsored by them, but I think that King Arthur all-purpose flour is the best um, easily available bread flour. Sometimes. <laughs> around. Yes, normally <laughs> available. Um, and, and so I said it's it, all-purpose flour is a great bread flour. I actually think that King Arthur bread flour is good for some things, but it, I prefer AP for bread. It's, it's much, it's got more gluten in it than other all-purpose flours, but not as much as other bread flours. And so it's kind of like the perfect middle for me. And so that's the white flour I keep around. Um, actually, I'll show this is <laughs> This is all King Arthur all-purpose flour. Um, that is awesome. So, yeah, and I didn't, I didn't hoard actually had that full before this all started. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, for other flours, I, I, I think it's really, great to be able to use local grains whenever possible. Um, and so there's a lot of um, New England millers and growers that are, are creating really good wheat flours and rye flours to use in baking. And so I think it's worth um, getting what you can locally and, and playing around with it. I usually, uh, even if I'm mixing, um, using this flour, I'll, I'll probably use 20% whole grain flour. I've been getting flour from gra uh, ground up in Hadley. Um, there's one mighty mill in Lynn. They make some really nice flowers and uh, main grains. Uh, yeah. So there's a lot of a lot of good stuff. Out. And you can mill your own as well. I have a, a small tabletop mill that I use uh, if I want to mill my own grains. Right, and a lot of the um, local places are doing mail order, uh, responding yeah. to the lack of flour at the grocery stores. Yeah, so. yeah and, and uh, people are local. Elmendorf in Cambridge uh, is still selling. They're doing curbside, and they have a ton of flours or grains from the New England area and beyond. So there's a lot of good flours to work with now. I mean, even five years ago, there was none of that, really. No, no, Mighty Mill didn't exist. Elmendorf didn't exist. Ground Up didn't exist. So there's a lot more. Main Grains has been around for a little bit longer. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But it's it's kind of a, a bit of a revolution in flowers. And and I think there's more to come on the line. Yeah, yeah. Things are getting smaller. I mean, our distribution, our food yeah. uh, infrastructure is getting battered on a number of levels. Um, and we have one more question. And I think this is our last. Sure. It's okay. Aliana all over. And it's what is a good general flour to use to turn any recipes gluten free? Oh, well, I, <laughs> so I'm not a gluten free expert. I, um, I've done two gluten free recipes for America's Test Kitchen. Uh, I did a pizza um, and I did a, a baguette. And um, that's about the extent of my gluten free experience. And I, I haven't, uh, done any baking with non-gluten flour since. I will say that we have a very good uh, series of gluten-free cookbooks and they have their own flour blends in them that are made from things you can buy in the grocery store like tapioca flour and potato starch. And the pizza recipe that I developed in the baguette recipe were based on those formulas. Um, so um, I think that there are definitely options out there for people who can't. I feel, I feel like I'm depriving people of something that I could teach them because I'm a, I'm a gluten expert, not, not a non-gluten. Right. Well, so sorry not to have that answer, yeah. but I'm sure we can find <laughs> it. Um, yes. Um, so I know many that King there's a lot of resources for gluten-free people too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess my last question uh, is what is the most kind of, uh, creative recipe you've come up with to use for discard. I know you've been trying, you've been putting out a few um, of them. So my, one of my favorite things to do with it is to um, use it to make Korean style pancakes. 
So Korean style pancakes are not leavened the way Western ones are. They're they're um, they're more of a flatbread. They don't have a lot of lift to them, but they're they're more crispy and kind of a little bit chewy and doughy on the inside. And a lot of recipes for Korean style pancakes are uh, have a equal parts mixture of flour and water as the base. And so I you know I noticed that and realized that was the perfect place to use a, a sourdough discard. And so you literally, if you just look up any kind of Korean pancake, it could be kimchi or scallion or seafood or any of those, um, you can literally just take the, take the flour and water out of the recipe and replace it with the same amount of discard. And it's great. It comes out kind of crispy and uh, browns really nice. And the, the, I, I actually find that the tang in uh, discard goes away with cooking a lot of the time. And so I don't really notice like a super, they're not super sour tasting. They're just really good. And plus the dipping sauce is what those are all about. So that the flavor is there. All right. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for spending this uh, hour with us, more than an hour. We had so many questions. I think people yeah, were really well, interested great. and I hope it was helpful for everyone. It was helpful for me. Um, it's great to see your kitchen <laughs> and <Yours> uh, <laughs> all your projects and, um, you know, learning how to mail yeast and all of this is so great. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, so I hope that people that uh, participated, like share your experiments. If you start trying, uh, you can contact yeah. the artery or you can um, follow along with Andrew as he's continuing his at quarantine starter project. Um, and yeah, keep us keep us posted because it's it's really fun and it's it's a bit of a community, wouldn't you say? Yeah, uh, for sure. It's grown, grown up around day. us. Yeah. yeah. So well, thank you, Andrew. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. It's fun to talk to you. Always. Yeah, it was great. Thank you again. Bye, everybody. Okay. Take care. So long, everyone. Happy baking. <laughs>